Hi, everyone. And I'm Ronnie Vargas Stidvent, Executive Director of the Center for Women in Law at the University of Texas Law School. Welcome to today's panel discussion, discussion Justice Ginsburg's impact on gender parity in the legal profession. Today's event has been approved for 1.25 hours of CLE by the Texas State Bar. If you're watching us in Zoom, you will get an email from us later this afternoon with information on how to claim your credit. If you happen to be calling in by phone or watching us live on Facebook, um, please let us know that you attended by sending us an email to Center for Women in Law, and that's all one word, at law.utexas.edu. And for those of you joining us uh, for an event for the first time, the Center for Women in Law is a national resource and champion for women lawyers, generating lasting change within the legal profession. At the center, we thought long and hard about how to honor the incredible legacy of the trailblazing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So today's panel is the launch of the Ginsburg Initiative, which honors the partnership of Justice Ginsburg and her husband, Marty Ginsburg, in pursuing gender equity. Through the Ginsburg Initiative, the center will advance gender neutral initiatives that promote gender parity in the legal profession and help realize our vision of a legal profession that exemplifies justice and equity for all. I invite you today to support our initiative by joining our Ginsburg Circle. And we're sharing that link with you now in our Zoom chat and on our Facebook page. And now for today's panel. We're so grateful for the support of nationwide legal search firm Lateral Link for their very generous support of today's event. And I'm also very, very thankful for today's moderator, David Latt, who has stepped in so that Nina Totenberg can join our panel and share her own insights and stories about Justice Ginsburg. Um, David, as many of you know, is a lawyer turned journalist and legal recruiter. He's a managing director at Lateral Link. And he's also, as many of you know, the founding editor of Above the Law. And he just started um, a new legal newsletter, a, a judicial, uh, I wanna make sure I get this right, Judicial Watch. Since I first started discussing the Ginsburg Initiative with David, he has been incredibly supportive and he has been tremendously helpful in making today's event ha happen. I am very lucky to count David as a friend since our um, days in law school. And I am delighted to turn over the virtual stage to David now to introduce our panelists. Thanks, David. Hey, thanks so much, Ronnie. It's great to be here. I'm really uh, delighted to join all of you. Uh, and yes, uh, as Ronnie mentioned, I do have a no new publication on Substack. It's uh, called Original Jurisdiction. It's uh, pretty easy to find. But this is not about me. Uh, this is about the great uh, Justice Ginsburg and her legacy in uh, law and uh, also her legacy in a more personal sense as well. And we are really uh, honored uh, to have such a tremendous, uh, tremendous panel. Uh, as Ronnie just mentioned, uh, I'm the managing director at Lateral Link, which is a national legal recruiting firm. Uh, as a company, uh, Lateral Link is deeply committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including gender equity in the law. So we are so pleased and proud to be sponsoring uh, today's event. I'm going to introduce the panelists very briefly now, but they are all leaders in their field. And really, as the old saying goes, they need a no introduction. Now, for more on them, I refer you to the center's website uh, or Google. Uh, first, we're honored to be joined by Nina Totenberg, uh, NPR's longtime award-winning legal affairs correspondent. She has received numerous awards for her work over the years, including the Peabody Award for her groundbreaking coverage of Professor Anita Hill's allegations of sexual harassment against then Judge Clarence Thomas, which led the Senate Judiciary Committee to reopen uh, Justice Thomas's hearings. Uh, I should mention uh, that uh, uh, Nina Totenberg, in addition to having covered the court and Justice Ginsburg for many years, was also a longtime friend of the justice, uh, someone who knew uh, Justice Ginsburg even before uh, Justice Ginsburg joined the court. And if you haven't read it already, you should read Nina's amazing obituary uh, for Justice Ginsburg on NPR. It's really one of the best I have ever read about any uh, person in any forum. So check it out uh, if you have not uh, read it already. Uh, I should also mention, uh, Nina happens to be covering some breaking news today, namely the filing of the impeachment briefs. Uh, so if you see her pop off uh, or she has to drop off early, uh, she has very good reason for doing so. Uh, this is just the life of the journalist. Uh, so Nina, we're so honored to have you with us. 
Uh, the remaining four panelists are a diverse group in their demographics and their professional occupations. Uh, we have a professor, two practicing lawyers, uh, an academic. But uh, one thing that they do share in common is they all served as law clerks for Justice Ginsburg. Their success in their different fields is in many ways a testament to both Justice Ginsburg's eye for talent and also her commitment to mentoring and developing that talent over the years. Uh, going in alphabetical order, first we have Ryan Park, the Solicitor General uh, for North Carolina. He's the state's lead appellate lawyer, including its lawyer before the Supreme Court. Last year, he won a unanimous victory for North Carolina in the case of Allen versus Cooper. He's a graduate of Amherst College and Harvard Law School, and he clerked for Justice Ginsburg from 2013 to 2014, so fairly late in her career on the court. We actually have tried to span uh, the years in terms of the clerks we've assembled today. Next up, we have actually one of Justice Ginsburg's first four clerks on the Supreme Court, uh, Alexandra Shapiro. She's a founding partner at Shapiro Arado Bach, one of the top litigation boutiques in the country. Alexandra represents individuals and institutions in criminal and regulatory matters, uh, complex civil litigation, and appeals, including appeals to the Supreme Court. She argued uh, before the court in Salman versus the United States, which was actually the first uh, insider trading case to be heard before the court in some two decades. Uh, fun little connection here, uh, when that case was before the Ninth Circuit, uh, Judge Watford, our other panelist, was on that panel. He did rule against Alexandra, but they assure me there are no hard feelings. Uh, so Alexandra, it's great to uh, have you with us. Uh, all, from the West Coast, uh, we have Amanda Tyler. She's the Shannon Cecil Professor of Law at UC Berkeley, where she teaches and writes about the Supreme Court, the federal courts, constitutional law. She's the author of, of three books, including most notably, Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue, A Life's Work Fighting for a More Perfect Union, which she co-authored with Justice Ginsburg. The book doesn't come out until next month, but you can pre-order it now on Amazon. And in fact, on the strength of those pre-orders, it's already Amazon's top uh, new release in Gender and the Law. Uh, during the panel, Amanda's going to speak not just about clerking for Justice Ginsburg, but about also working with her as a co-author. Uh, finally, we are thrilled to be joined by the Honorable Paul J. Watford, a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He was nominated by President Obama in October 2011, confirmed to the bench in May 2012. Uh, before taking the bench, Judge Watford served as a federal prosecutor and worked as a partner at Munger, Tolles & Olson in Los Angeles. Uh, in 2016, a fellow panelist, Nina Totenberg, reported that Judge Watford was interviewed by President Obama for the Supreme Court opening uh, created by the passing of the late Justice Scalia. And Judge Watford today is still widely considered a top Supreme Court prospect in a Biden administration. And now, uh, on to our discussion. I should mention that we will leave time for audience questions at the end. Uh, so if you have questions for the panelists, uh, you can type them in uh, through the Zoom interface. Uh, so the lawyers among you are getting continuing legal education credit for this, as Ronnie mentioned. So let's begin with some doctrine. Uh, we'll start with Professor Tyler, who is an academic, sees the big picture. Um, Amanda, can you give us an overview of Justice Ginsburg's jurisprudence, uh, particularly with an eye to uh, of equality and uh, justice? I'd be delighted to, and I want to thank you for convening us. I'm really honored to be in the company of, of this extraordinary panel. Um, Justice Ginsburg's legacy as a justice, particularly on the Supreme Court, her time on the Supreme Court, I think is marked by two major aspects, two major principles that really animate all that she did. The first was, importantly, uh, to make ours, I like to, to say, a constitution that leaves no one behind. And what I mean by that is uh, that her jurisprudence was very much defined by a celebration and a work toward ensuring that ours is an ever more inclusive constitution. In her crown jewel of an opinion for the court in the VMI case in 1996, she celebrated specifically that the story of our constitution is of evolution to be more and more inclusive. Um, and I should note, we have uh, a former clerk with us today who was clerking for her, I believe that term, so he might shed some light on that that time uh, when she announced that very important, wrote and announced that very important decision. You see that principle animate all of her jurisprudence. If you go back and you look at the long arc of her decisions on the court, you see someone who in 2003 in Grutter was writing about how important it is for us still to reckon with and confront both conscious and unconscious racial bias. 
You see it in her disability decisions. She wrote several decisions about the Americans with Disabilities Act, where she celebrated the act and talked about how important accommodation is to bring people into uh, what a phrase she used in VMI, full citizenship status uh, in our society. You see it in her uh, participation in oral arguments and votes in uh, the cases of Windsor and uh, Obergefell and Windsor. She had that amazing line during oral argument uh, before later voting to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act. She called the secondary uh, civil unions that had been offered for same-sex marriages, a sort of skim milk marriage. Uh, so you see all of this animating her jurisprudence. Another aspect of her jurisprudence uh, was one of preserving and promoting access to justice. And, and it's a part of her jurisprudence who I, that I don't, don't think gets enough attention. She was a former civil procedure professor. It's a topic I also teach. So I teach a lot of her opinions in that context. And they are uniformly uh, in favor of opening up access to justice. So her great dissent in a personal jurisdiction case called McIntyre uh, is a dissent. Uh, I, it just it, it couldn't be better. It couldn't be more forceful. She wrote against uh, the court's trend to uphold arbitration agreements against class litigation, something that really seems at odds with what the Federal Arbitration Act was intended to do. Uh, past decades before the class action even really comes into being. She dissented in the Walmart case about uh, complaining and chastising her court majority for making it so much harder for Title VII plaintiffs to band together and bring class actions, uh, challenging discriminatory practices. And you see it, it you see also coming full, full scope in the gender context, of course. VMI is the crown jewels, I've said, of her jurisprudence. But then if you continue and you go all the way through her 27 years on the Supreme Court, what do we find? Her final opinion written for the court in the Little Sisters of the Poor case last summer is one in which she is again talking about how important it is for women to be able to chart their own course in their lives and chart their own destinies. There she was, uh, somewhat fittingly, but also frustratingly in dissent, uh, complaining about the majority now again, reading the Americans, uh, the ACA, um, you know, Obamacare, as some people call it, uh, for allowing uh, employers to opt out from providing for contraceptive coverage. A second thing I will highlight about her jurisprudence beyond what I think is the most important trend of it, which is to uh, really make it possible for all persons or certainly try to make it possible for all persons to achieve their full human potential is that you can tell when you read her opinions that she appreciated very acutely how the court's decisions affected real people's lives. And she made a very conscious effort to understand how the court's decisions would function on the ground. You see this in so many of her opinions to give just an example, um, in the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby case, an earlier case in which she also dissented about the ACA's contraceptive mandate, she writes at length about how expensive it is for women to obtain contraceptive coverage. And she explains to the all-male majority how if you make it harder for women to access these things, it will have significant impacts. And that is why this is a an important, excuse me, government interest. You also see it in her fantastic dissent in the Shelby County case, on which she walks the reader through the second, um, the second stage barriers that are being put up to continue Jim Crow in, in certain voting districts and make it harder uh, for individuals to exercise the franchise, something that we've seen. Uh, we've seen the wisdom of the words of that dissent really play out uh, in the last election. So I think that those are the twin pillars of her jurisprudence, making ours a constitution that leaves no one behind and making sure that the court understands how its decisions impact the lived, lived experiences of the full spectrum of members of our society. Thank you so much, Amanda. And what I really appreciate about that overview is it reminds everyone that even though Justice Ginsburg is most well known, I think, for her work 
when it comes to gender parity and gender equity, this was not her exclusive concern when it comes to equality and equity and justice. And I think the overview you uh, provided is just very, very helpful uh, in that respect. Uh, I think we all think of the Virginia Military Institute case, the VMI case, and also the Lily Ledbetter case, which led to subsequent legislation that vindicated her dissent. We think of her for those decisions. And uh, I would mention that we do have the readings collected on the central website, uh, and those two decisions are there. But really, uh, what uh, Professor Tyler just outlined is a full list of additional reading of uh, work by Justice Ginsburg uh, on that front as a justice. Of course, before she was a justice, she was a crusading litigator for uh, gender equality. And so uh, she, I believe she argued before the Supreme Court in a half dozen cases and won almost all of them. Uh, so I wanted to turn to um, Alexandra Shapiro, a very accomplished litigator uh, who has argued before the court as well for an appraisal of uh, Justice Ginsburg's work as a litigator before the court. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, David. And um, I think one of the most remarkable things about Justice Ginsburg is that uh, she's one of the few justices in our history who probably would be known as one of the most important um, Americans in the 20th and early 21st century, even if she had never been nominated to the Supreme Court because, or even been a judge because of her path marking, as she would say, work, although she wouldn't say this about herself, of course, as a litigator. And I think um, her, her work as a litigator actually reflects um, those same qualities um, you know, that, that you mentioned about her, her jurisprudence in the sense that, um, one, uh, her, her work was designed to, um, you know, make sure that the we, the people in the Constitution actually reached um, as many of we, the people, as it could and, and expanded um, uh, that notion. And also, um, I think that she, and, and that, that her strategy, um, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, was also informed by the idea of persuading the court that uh, the cases and the principles she was arguing for really would affect real people's lives. And um, so in that regard, um, I think that one can look at the types of cases she selected and, and that she accepted um, to try to push the cause of, of women's rights and gender equality. And um, they were, the, her clients were not, you know, um, they were not fancy people. Um, she didn't do big class actions. They were mostly individual Americans um, who had been affected by some uh, gender uh, equity issue. And she often, as is well known, she often chose men as the plaintiffs because as part of a strategy to helping um, persuade the men on the Supreme Court, uh, that there was an injustice, you know, whether it was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the father whose wife had been the sole breadwinner and wasn't being given access to Social Security spouse disability benefits in the Wiesenfeld case, or even cases where less uh, perhaps important things were at stake, such as Craig v. Boren, which was uh, a case in which um, that the justice didn't argue but wrote the briefs, in which uh, the, the, the issue was that um, the state of, I believe it was Oklahoma, had a law that allowed women at the age of 18 to uh, get near beer, whereas men could only get it when they were 21. Um, and she used um, uh, a number of cases like that um, to really get sympathy from the male justices to understand that gender equality affects both genders and that, you know, America really needs to treat both genders equally. And the other thing that I, I wanted to mention about her, her litigation that I think is important and informed her, her um, jurisprudence, both on the DC circuit and ultimately on the Supreme Court, at least in the early years, is that she well understood that in order to affect change, um, you can't produce lasting change if uh, you sort of shoot for the moon at the get-go and that it really needs to be a gradual process. You need to get public acceptance of broadening of, of rights. And, and, uh, and so, you know, just as in her litigation, um, she took on, you know, small causes one at a time um, and, you know, argued for intermediate scrutiny, for instance, um, I think uh, she understood, and, and she wrote, um, she gave a 
famous lecture in 1992 at NYU, the Madison Lecture, uh, in which some on the left criticized her, but her point, um, and she used abortion as an example, was that a, one of the problems with the way Roe v. Wade was wit written was that it involved um, a Texas law that basically barred all abortions except, I believe, to save the life of the mother. And it could have just simply, uh, the court could have struck it down um, on that basis and placed more of a focus on the fact um, that it impacted women's ability to choose their own path um, and sort of stop there. But instead, the court went on to basically create a mini regulatory regime that was going to cover the waterfront on this issue. And her view had always been that that, that was one of the reasons for the backlash that uh, that came next and that it's important, you know, to kind of move at a gradual pace so there can be acceptance. And she, in, in, um, in many of her decisions, um, uh, she took a, a sort of more narrow path and kind of put things back in the legislature's court. Um, that happened a lot in her uh, criminal law jurisprudence, which doesn't get talked about it as much, but also is another example where I think many of her decisions um, really were aimed at expanding the rights of the accused. Um, so I would say all in all, I think one of the, the lessons to learn from her advocacy is that her sort of gradualist approach to the strategy when she was an advocate did carry on to her, um, to her time as a judge and justice. And I think, uh, you know, was, was, uh, was really uh, uh, somewhat remarkable and, um, and unique at the time um, when, you know, when she was appointed to the Supreme Court, it's interesting. Um, I went back and, and listened to um, her swearing in at the White House and President Clinton, uh, I thought he, he mentioned um, one thing that seems kind of quaint now and is hard to believe given her image uh, at, the, at this time in our history. But at the time he said, you know, she has emerged as one of our country's finest justice, progressive in outlook, wise in judgment, balanced and fair in her opinions. And then he said, she defied labels like liberal and conservative, just as, you know, and, and that she was really known for excellence. Um, and I think uh, that, uh, you know, that, that it's important to remember that part of why she was able to accomplish so much in uh, in her jurisprudence and in her advocacy was her gradualist approach to produce lasting change. I think that's a great point you make, Alexandra, about how just as an advocate alone, even if she had never been on the court, she would still be a great uh, American hero. I think that's a really uh, important point. And I think the, the gradualism of her strategy uh, was a huge part of her success as an advocate. Uh, turning to her time as a judge, to her time on the bench, uh, we're really lucky to have with us uh, one of her clerks who is now a judge himself, uh, Judge Paul Watford of the Ninth Circuit. And uh, Judge Watford, uh, how could you, uh, what would you say uh, about Justice Ginsburg's approach to judging and perhaps how it might have influenced your own approach to uh, how you handle cases on the bench? Sure. Uh, well, I, I feel incredibly lucky to have had one of the best role models any judge could ask for. Um, both during the year I spent with uh, with Justice Ginsburg as a law clerk, but also just in the many years I I got to uh, to be mentored by her afterwards. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe I could highlight a few of the lessons that I've drawn from uh, uh, my time with her and watching her over the years uh, that I've tried to emulate as a judge myself. Um, the the number one uh, thing that I took away I think focuses on collegiality and the importance she placed on being a, a good colleague and what that meant. Um, it's, it's, there's so many lessons that one could draw from uh, watching her that I wish more of our, our public officials now these days would, uh, would try to emulate themselves because she really was just a model, uh, a model colleague and a model judge. Um, she, uh, she taught us from really day one um, that she did not view those with whom she disagreed as her enemies in any way. Um, she uh, always emphasized that you have to show respect um, for all of your colleagues, whether they're on, on your side or not. Um, and that, that sense of mutual respect and, and a willingness to listen to those uh, who, you know, with whom you might be inclined to disagree, I think really marked her, um, 
her as a judge. Uh, it's certainly one of the qualities of all of the, the great judges that I admire, and I, I think she really exemplified that. Um, certainly her, her friendship with Justice Scalia gets a front billing in, in that respect, um, and it, it really was a remarkable friendship that uh, I think was, um, you know, it, it really taught me that you do not have to um, I mean, that you you can actually be friends with people uh, that you strongly disagree with. I, I had never really uh, experienced that in life. Most of the time, um, you know, you uh, if you strongly disagree with people, you tend to, uh, you know, to not want to uh, to become their friends. But she and, and Justice Scalia obviously enjoyed uh, an extremely warm friendship. But that was just one uh, of many friendships of that sort of that sort that she uh, that she had on the court and, and during her time on the D.C. Circuit as well. Um, so I, I think uh, the other thing that really struck me about um, the importance she placed on collegiality was, um, you know, she she had such respect for the Supreme Court as, as an institution, and she always viewed the institution as way, way more important than any of the individual uh, personalities who, who temporarily inhabited it. And so she, she was constantly stressing that, look, this is not about, you know, any one of us, you know, nothing um, you know, about what we might think um, uh, can can detract from the importance of the institution. And you would never want to do anything as a judge, um, you know, that would um, that would diminish the uh, the uh, the respect for the institution. Um, and that carried over again, just in terms of how she dealt. Uh, she dealt with her colleagues. Um, one of the things I, I really uh, admired about her is just in terms of her writing. She never made things personal. Um, she never went in full attack mode where, um, you know, you felt she was uh, trying to, to denigrate the uh, the other side or um, or really, as I said, just show any any form of disrespect. And uh, one of the lessons I remember um, that she she taught me in one of the cases in which we were going to dissent that I, I try to follow now is she said, uh, Paul, I want a draft of I want a full draft of the dissent before we receive the majority opinion. And. She explained why she she liked to take that approach. She said, I don't want our dissent just to be an attack piece that tries to go through and point by point explain why you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that, you know, you're wrong about the other thing. Um, she wanted to lay out an affirmative case uh, as to why the case should have been decided differently um, and, to, um, and to do that in a respectful way that was not going to, to just be about trying to tear down the, the other side's arguments. Um, and that's something that I, I still I do myself. I mean, I, I always want to just, um, if I have a case in which I'm going to dissent, dissent, I want the dissent uh, written before we ever even see the majority opinion. Um, just in terms of her writing, uh, I so, so admired um, how much care and hard work she put into crafting her opinions. She was, uh, as, as all of us who, who clerk for her know, so meticulous about language, and uh, she just worked so hard to make sure that her opinions were clear. Um, and uh, I think that was the thing that that uh, um, stood out for me the most in terms of her writing. It's just the the emphasis on clarity. Uh, I uh, just in terms of my own writing style, I've tried to to emulate her because she she showed you that you did not have to be flashy or entertaining in terms of how you wrote in in order to be extremely uh, powerful. And, and, and extremely good um, at the judicial craft, and so um, I, I don't know. I, I her, her writing obviously is is very different from uh, from that of some of her other colleagues who came to be admired. But I always thought of her as one of the very best uh, writers on the court. Um, I guess the only other thing I would mention, just in terms of her approach to judging, is I would just stress again how hard she worked at the job. Um, I think we we all have come to learn probably in our careers that really none of the the, the extremely successful people that we we admire um, uh, you know can get by just by by winging things that all of them whether you can see it uh, because you know many people are able to make things look easy um, but behind the scenes um, people who are really successful just work extremely hard and that Justice Ginsburg was no exception to that she was um, uh, I mean she just was you know, worked so late into the night. I, I still remember the 2 a.m., 3 a.m. voicemails from her as she was working through an opinion and had questions that uh, she wanted to uh, to leave for you so that by the time she came in the next afternoon, you would have been able to think through them. Um, 
but she um, she really instilled that uh, that lesson in me that uh, you know if you want to be good at anything, you've just got to put in the time and the effort and the hard work uh, because there just are there are no shortcuts. I think that's a great point, Judge Watford, about her approach to writing dissents. I think her legacy in many ways in recent years has been that of a great dissenter uh, from a fairly conservative court. And it's really interesting to hear how she would try to set up an independent framework rather than just a point-by-point rebuttal. Um, Turning to uh, Nina Totenberg, who's known the justice for so many years and was a dear friend of hers, uh, it's easy for us to forget in 2021 that in some ways she really was this pathbreaker and her view on gender equality would at one point have been seen as radical or uh, unusual. Um, How did Justice Ginsburg uh, see herself, Nina? Did she sort of see herself, uh, uh, you know, her approach was also gradualist at the same time as Alexandra mentioned, but Mm -hmm. how did the justice sort of perceive herself as as an advocate and and a jurist over the years and that evolution? I'm actually not sure how she saw herself. She did talk continually in interviews that I did with her that were in public and in private. Um, She talked continually about how you couldn't change society before the society was ready to be changed. Mm -hmm. And she would classically give as an example, um, the post-World War II era when African-Americans fought hard in World War II, came back expecting to be treated as equal participants in a society and were not. And that that led almost inexorably in a matter of a very few years, relatively speaking, to the civil rights movement in the early 50s, mid 50s and beyond. Um, And she talked about that often when she was talking about gay marriage in the, you know, in the last few years, because Clearly, this was not something that society would have accepted or contemplated 30, 40, 50 years ago. And um, it struck me, as many things did about Justice Ginsburg, you know, she was not a perfect person, but she was incredibly wise. She really had, she was open to almost anything. And you saw that in her personal life, so the art on her walls was uh, modern art. It was Rothko, it was abstract. It was not the traditional art that's in every other justice's chambers it ver- to varying degrees. Um, and she was like that about music. She once took me to, and my husband to an opera at the Met, which was about, um, somebody saved me from my, um, Alzheimer's disease, uh, the guy who was in the wheelchair who was shoved off of a, of a boat uh, that was captured by Palestinian activists probably in the 70s or 80s, something like that. And it was a very, it was a, an opera that was sought to treat the Palestinians and the Jews and the Israelis on a more equal level. And therefore it got, it was very controversial. And this was the opening and it was at the Met, and she invited me and my husband to come with her, have dinner with her beforehand, and go to this opera, and we were in a box, and I I turned around to her, the U.S. Marshal, who always took care of her in New York, George, uh, and I said, "Uh, George, um, there are more ushers down there than I am used to seeing when she takes me to the opera. Are those your folks? And he said, you might think that, um, because there was really, con- there was the occasional yell from the, somebody in the audience, but there was really concern that something bad might happen. Well, this is a long way of saying that, you know, she was a, she was not a particularly practicing, actively religious Jew, but she was very definitely and importantly Jewish. And still, she was perfectly able to see the Palestinian point of view. And there was a scene in in this opera also that was somebody was naked. And she did say to me after, this is classic Bruce, she said, I don't quite understand why he had to be naked. (laughs) But I'm sure she thought about it because she was always, you know, you bring it on in terms of new ideas. She was willing to entertain almost anything. And she was perfectly capable of rejecting it without malice, so to speak. But she was such an open person 
in terms of her mind. That mind could entertain almost any idea, deal with it, rebut it, answer it. And if I have to say, responding to what Amanda and Paul said, um, if I could choose to be two models for, for my writing, if I could write as well as Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, polar opposites, mind you, in their the, in the way they express themselves. But I would like to be a combination of the two because his writing was so vivid. It was such, it was a, a, a portrait in such bright colors of his views. Hers was the opposite, but it was so compact in the most journalistic way. When you read a really great piece that's uh, about some I, something in the law and it's or or an event and it's com it's in a thousand words and somehow you come away feeling like you you completely understand it or you or like you were there uh, that's what she was able to do and even in the very last really weeks of her life um the last couple of months she was doing that because of the shadow docket. The court was just nonstop working because of the shadow docket. And I can't remember what which voting case it was that she dissented from. And it was like four or six pages long. It would take me 20 pages to describe what she said in that. It was so <laughs> exquisitely compact and restrained. And at the same time, it was a, a restrained kind of ferocity. It was perfect. It was pitch perfect. And so that's what I, those are some of the things I I have. There are many traits that she had that I, I would like to be better at. Um, she would stand up for anybody, anytime. She, she would seize the moment to stand up for anybody, anytime. She would insert herself to quietly stand up for somebody that she, when she thought something had been wrong. She was, as Paul said, a, a very determined colleague in terms of collegiality and in terms of strategy. So when she was assigning opinions, um, she was assigning them to people that she very much disagreed with normally, because she knew that was the way to keep the case coming out the way she wanted it to come out. I even somewhat suspect that in the discrimination against, against gays in employment case, the Title VII case, um, I have a deep suspicion that she, she assigned that case to Justice Gorsuch. And I have some suspicion based on nothing that perhaps the Chief Justice when it came along. Now the Chief could have assigned it to Gorsuch he was certainly the senior person. I don't know that, but she made it a habit of assigning stuff to Gorsuch. I have no reason to believe that she had a deep personal relationship with him and deeply trusted him. I think she, what she deeply trusted was his ideas. And if he was willing to go along with her, she was willing to go along with him. That's really interesting. And I think it was in many ways a brilliant move to assign uh, Bostock and Zarda to Justice Gorsuch yes, he because did. he wrote- he the chief might have, I, I could be dead wrong. I kind of uh, agree with your theory, though, Nina. I, it just makes sense to me. Uh, she was, for many years, the senior most uh, liberal justice, and so she had that assigning power. And just she was so strategic in so many things, uh, certainly in her litigation strategies Alexander talked about. So it makes perfect sense to me. Um, one follow-up question for you. I know you've talked about this in some of your interviews with her. What did she make of the whole notorious RBG phenomenon, people painting their nails and getting RBG tattooed on their bodies and all of that? Like, what did she make of her cult figure status? Well, I think she rather enjoyed it on the one hand. as She was just amazed by it. I do think it's something nobody has quite explained. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. This woman did not become a cult figure until she was like 79 years old. <laughs> she was not a cult figure when she wrote VMI. She was a cult figure to women who were particularly interested in gender equality and lawyers who specialized in that area and young women who 
who were just coming into the law and knew about, sort of about her role. But she was not a cult figure nationally. Nobody knew really who Ruth Bader Ginsburg was. And then suddenly, you know, every child, girl child is wearing a, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg Halloween outfit. There are two major te- uh, movies made about her. Um, and all of these things fed each other, of course, and she did enjoy it. But I am not entirely sure of the why, why it happened. And I can only conclude that it came along at a time when um, women were, were in fact coming into their own in professionally and in all ways, and uh, in, in business and et cetera, but were not quite at the top of the heap. And that so they suddenly turned around and realized where they'd come from and where they still wanted to go. And she was as, as much as she could be the emblem of that. And there was something also about her very diminutive self, her very quiet voice and understated way. I mean, one of the last very big interviews I did of her was in Little Rock, Arkansas, in the Verizon Center they had had to move it because they had too many people wanting to come. So they had 16,000 tickets for this thing. They sold out within hours. It was a Clinton library event and they had an equal number on the waiting list. And Clinton joked that there were, that there were more people wanting to go to this event than lived in Little Rock. <laughs> so I did this interview and she was already pretty sick in a lot of ways. And I don't think she'd slept much the night before. I think she'd had gastrointestinal issues. And I saw her first thing in the morning or first thing in the morning for Ruth, which is about 10. Um, And uh, and she looked just pretty frazzled. And then she came and I said, can I do anything to help you? She said, get out of here, get out of here. 15 minutes, she emerges from that room. She's perfectly coiffed. She has a little bit of makeup on. She looks as if she's had you know, eight hours of good sleep. And she has, and we do several events culminating in this event in the Verizon Center. So there's 16,000 people in this place that normally there are basketball contests and things like that. And the two of us sitting like in the pit at the bottom, and she's like by then like 85 pounds, and you could have heard a pin drop. It was over an hour, you could have heard a pin drop. The place just rocked afterwards. I mean, and I can't explain that entirely. And I'm happy to have anybody else's thoughts (laughs) because I think about this all the time. Well, it's interesting. This is a good opportunity to to bring in Ryan Park uh, because in our preparation for this, we had a discussion amongst the panel. And and Ryan, you had some thoughts uh, on RBG's sort of cultural status. Um, But I also wanted to tee up for you, Ryan, uh, the topic of how working with Justice Ginsburg might have affected your own personal and professional choices. Because in addition to Nina's great obituary for the justice, uh, you should all also read Ryan's piece in The Atlantic about how Justice Ginsburg affected his uh, own personal and professional choices. So uh, Ryan, can you uh, speak uh, to these topics uh, a little bit? Sure, of course. So I think one of the things that makes the clerkship experience so special and celebrated in the law uh, is that it comes at a formative moment uh, in most of our lives and careers. Usually we're just a few years out of law school in our late 20s or early 30s. Uh, and, you know, we're emerging from, at least nowadays, kind of the death rattle of extended adolescence and having two feet <laughs> firmly planted into adulthood. Uh, and this is a time when we have to make many of the life choices about our priorities and our values uh, that Justice Ginsburg fought for our freedom to make on our own terms. And whether to start a family and get married or not, uh, and if you you do choose to, what kind of marriage and family structure to establish and what kind of career to pursue and how to balance your professional aspirations with your values and your interests. So uh, I confronted these decisions in stark terms like many uh, other clerks uh, during my own year clerking. Uh, I had my first daughter, our first daughter, uh, just a few months before the clerkship started. And uh, my wife who had taken a research year after medical school uh, in part so I could have the freedom to focus on a job of a lifetime uh, was just beginning her intern year uh, when my clerkship was wrapping up. And uh, as many likely know, uh, you know, that is a, an extremely grueling experience, uh, far more than any job in the law, uh, where you're easily working 100-hour weeks, 
uh, week after week and 36 hour shifts and seeing a lot of suffering uh, and death. And so I had to grapple seriously uh, with these issues for the first time as I was emerging from the clerkship and, and how I was going to try to you know, focus uh, our family. And, uh, you know, I just started to take a short amount of time uh, with my daughter after uh, the clerkship uh, while my wife was focusing uh, on her career. And I can tell you there was no one in the entire world outside of my family who was more supportive of this choice uh, than Justice Ginsburg and more encouraging of me to speak about it publicly. Uh, and that culminated, as, as David said, in, in an Atlantic piece that you know, I, I, I was surprised by how much attention it got. Um, but it kind of keyed into the, the moment uh, at the time when uh, I think, as, as Nina meant, uh, mentioned, there uh, you know, was a great hunger and still is uh, for figures uh, like Justice Ginsburg uh, to have uh, as, as heroes. And uh, you know, I think part of the reason why uh, Justice Ginsburg and I bonded so much over this experience is she faced a very similar situation uh, when she uh, was in law school. So she entered Harvard Law School with a one-year-old daughter and uh, that situation became far more challenging when her husband, Marty, uh, was diagnosed with cancer and she had to care for him, which she did while graduating at the top of her class, which is uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, but I think, you know, more broadly throughout their lives together, uh, the Justice and, and Marty, they tried to live their values to support each other as equal partners. And, you know, that's something that she tried to model throughout society. And it was really what was driving her work, right? So she did not merely want to create changes in the law. The law was never abstract to her. Uh, underlying her work was always this commitment that uh, if you cast away outdated legal structures, that would lead to changes in broader society and, and how people live their lives. And you know, the justice, as Alexander mentioned, she's rightly credited with the brilliant legal strategy of representing men in gender discrimination gender discrimination cases. Uh, and it was a strategy and it was brilliant uh, because it allowed uh, her a chance to break through to an all-male Supreme Court and show them that blind adherence to traditional gender norms harms everyone, including men and children and women. Uh, but she really believed it. And I can attest to that personally. Uh, she was so excited <laughs> when I told her about this and when I told her uh, I was thinking about writing about it. And I don't think I would have written about it if she wasn't so encouraging. Uh, and uh, she, you know, she worked with me on drafts and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that when we think about the justice's legacy, as, as we're all doing now, uh, it, it's really a two-part enterprise of instilling the values of equality in the law, uh, in society, but then actually uh, living it. And she very much believed they have to live it as well. Uh, and so I think for all of us, including the clerks who kind of have the luxury uh, in our positions to uh, you know, work to create this permission structure uh, for the broader society. It's part of our, it's part of our responsibility. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Uh, and so I guess to take it back to, uh, you know, Nina's question, uh, you know, I, I really, so we were clerking and this is 2013, uh, right around the time uh, when the notorious RBG was, was reaching a popular crescendo and, uh, you know, the, the SNL skits and the videos and the memes. And, and we would show some of these to her and she would just kind of laugh and then and move on and not dwell on them. Um, but you could tell that this, this woman who was 80 at the time, uh, you know, she enjoyed it, yes. Uh, but she also understood what it meant. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, what her ability to be out there in the public could do, but the fact that it was garnering this interest that she <laughs> as a quiet, retiring 80-year-old Supreme Court justice was getting that kind of interest, uh, what it meant for uh, the hunger that was out there. And I think that's why she embraced it so heartily. I think that's a very important point, Ryan. I think that the publicity and the media attention she garnered also brought attention to the issues that she worked so tirelessly to advance as an advocate and, and as a judge. And so it makes, it makes perfect sense to me. And it's interesting, I think, her support of your plan to be a stay-at-home dad is in some ways mirroring her litigation strategy that sometimes in order to advance equality, maybe you have to focus on what the men are doing as well as the women. And I think that, you know, it's very interesting. Um, Amanda, when we were talking about, um, you know, preparing for this panel, you also had some words of wisdom that Justice Ginsburg had given you at a point in your life when you were struggling with just how to get it all done, how to juggle, how to, you know, I know people can't have it all, but just how to balance that personal and professional life, which she and Marty did so brilliantly. Um, can you share some of that with us? Sure. I mean, pick, picking up on what's been said, uh, clerking for her when Marty was alive was a true joy. Uh, I can't, 
I, I can't even begin to describe how awesome it was to watch the two of them interact and to have a, a, a front row seat to what was a love affair for the ages. Um, it really, it just was so special. And as Ryan said, these are very impressionable years for many clerks. They certainly were for me. Um, I was taking notes. That's what I want in a partner. <laughs> and um, it just was, it was so special. I, I, I've been thinking a lot in the last few days about that year that I got to spend with her. It was the first time she had cancer. She'd had surgery only, I think, a week uh, maybe two weeks before the term started. She'd only come home from the hospital a few days before the term started. And uh, nonetheless, she was on the bench on the first day of the term, which no one had expected. Uh, I remember I was the, the early bird in chambers that year. So I was at my desk and when she called from the car and said, go tell the chief I'm coming. And uh, it, it just what a, a special assignment. I was so thrilled. Uh, but what I remember taking it back to, to her relationship with Marty about that year most of all is how he doted on her. He came to, to usher her home. You're working too late. You need to rest. He worked so hard to make sure she could keep her weight up. I remember going to dinner at their, at their home, and uh, I remember how he had planned this whole meal around, as he said, you know, we've got to fatten her up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he just, they were so devoted to each other. And, and as Ryan said, they came to law school with a toddler and then faced tremendous adversity when Marty was so sick. When I uh, had my first child a few years after clerking for her, I went back to work at the same time that I did a visit at Harvard Law School. I was going to Harvard to teach. And I wrote her a letter. Um, and I was reading her response. I was going back through correspondence recently and I, I shared with her how nervous I was. How am I going to do this? Uh, this is this is all new to me. And suddenly work-life balance, it seems far more consequential than it ever did. There's this little child that I'm supposed to be taking care of and shepherding into the world. And she wrote back something that was as simple as it was elegant. She wrote, where there's a will, there's a way. And that was her way of saying, you can do this, you know, you, 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 you will figure it out. And then, and then interestingly enough, she went on to write in great detail the different, about the different babysitting services she had used when she was in law school at Harvard. And, you know, I might try this and I might try that. And I take great amusement at that because the, the gap is many, many decades <laughs> between these, these two periods. Um, but she, and that's the other thing about her is that she was trying so hard always to be so helpful. She was in our corner cheering for us, but she was also on the ground, you know, trying to be helpful. And uh, it just, to have a, a mentor in your life who you know is rooting for you is a really special thing. I hope that everyone has that in their lives. I just want to tell you a really funny story. So I, am one, in a moment of great weakness, had agreed to be the after-dinner keynote speaker at the American Law Institute. And I suddenly realized, and I, I really did have to get talked into it. And then as time grew closer, I was in a total panic because <clears throat> all these people are going to know much more about the law and certainly about Supreme Court doctrine than I do. And, you know, what, and I figured out, I figured out a way to write something, but I was really uncharacteristically in a panic about this. And I said to her, what am I going to do? I mean, these people know way more than me. And she's, oh, they have a long cocktail hour. They'll all be drunk by then. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's really nice to hear this sort of I think everyone thinks of her, you know, it's fairly serious, but it's great to just hear these stories about her fun, sort of irreverent side. I think people often regarded Marty as the more extroverted person, which I, I think is fair, but she definitely had like a sly wit and sense of humor, it seems. Oh, yeah, but she she was serious about this. They were all drunk. They laughed at everything they said. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's true. Whenever I give these talks, I'm like, yeah, I want to be after the cocktail hour. Um, uh, Alexandra, uh, uh, you clerked for Justice Ginsburg in that very first 
term when, you know, of course, she was struggling to, to figure it all out. What do you what do you recall about that time? Yeah, so it, it was a really fun time, I think, um, because everything was about the court was really new to her. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, so we were sort of all learning the process together. I mean, obviously, she'd been a court of appeals judge for 12 years, but but the cert process and also the death penalty docket were totally new to her. Um, and uh, so it was a really interesting and, and kind of fun time, I think, to be there, to be sort of learning it all with her. Um, she, you know, uh, to your point about her sense of humor, you know, I mean, uh, she would she would tell us what happened at the conferences and and make little jokes here and there about certain, some of the personalities and and um, and interestingly uh, at the beginning Chief Chief Justice Rehnquist was the chief at the time and I think when she first started she thought she didn't have a great relationship with him at the beginning um, and I think she, she just wasn't sure what to make of him I think the first opinion she got assigned was which was not my case, was a, a rather boring statutory question. And, you know, I think she just didn't realize that since she was the new justice, that was the kind of thing, uh, those were the kind of opinions she was going to get at the beginning. And then over time, um, certainly in the in the years after my term, she actually uh, became quite friendly with Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, and, uh, but, but another thing that I thought uh, is kind of a fun fact was that that first year, um, when she had to decide uh, what chambers to take, and she chose not to take, I think it was Justice White, who she was replacing his old chambers on the first floor. All of the other justices had their chambers on the first floor, and she didn't like his chambers. It was too dark. It had too much wood paneling, and she actually chose uh, another set of chambers on the second floor, um, which was much lighter and, um, and you know, she Baker. the way she wanted Baker. to was also bigger, but it was, uh, you know, and that was like sort of revolutionary. No one had done that before. Um, but, uh, and, and, uh, you know, Marty was a, a constant presence. We, we were invited over for dinner multiple times and had, um, you know, he, you know, experienced the classical Marty cooking, um, and uh, but it was it was really interesting to kind of um, be there when she was kind of getting her feet wet with the cert process, which she was very strategic about in the same way that, as Nina mentioned, she would be much later when she was in, in able to assign opinions. Obviously, she was the junior justice my year. But, you know, there are often these issues where, you know, do you really want to be the fourth vote for cert or are you going to regret it? And she was very strategic about that sort of thing and waiting for the right case on some issue that she cared about to make sure it would come out the right way. I think that's a good, uh, oh, by the way, I should mention uh, audience members, please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A. Uh, some of the questions I'm posing now actually come from the audience. So we're already, we've already crossed over into Q&A time. Um, so what Alexandra was just saying about Justice Ginsburg's transition to the bench, uh, Judge Watford, uh, what advice did she give you when uh, either about the nomination process or about your early years on the bench? Uh, was she a, a source of wisdom and counsel for you just about going from being a lawyer to being a judge? Oh, very much so, yes. Um, I remember going to speak to her at the very beginning of the process when I was unsure about whether uh, to even... Of try to pursue becoming a judge. And, you know, I, it was at a point in my career, I was about 43 or 44 then. Um, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was, uh, you know, doing well as a practicing lawyer, um, making way more money than I expected to, but I really was not satisfied. Um, and I, um, I, I knew I wanted to do something else, but I wasn't sure what it was. And I went to speak to her. And I remember she had always said that, uh, you know, one of the keys to having a satisfying career is you've got to do something in which you are doing something outside yourself, in which you're doing something to try to better the lives of other people. And she really stressed that as, as one of the key sources of satisfaction for herself. Um, and so I, I wondered, you know, is being a judge, does that give you that kind of satisfaction? How have you how have you enjoyed your time on the bench? Is this something that I should basically just throw away my career as a practicing lawyer and do this for the rest of my life? And she said, without any hesitation, Paul, absolutely, you will love it. I guarantee it. You will love being a judge. 
Um, it is just, and, you know, she just explained why she derives so much satisfaction um, from the work that she did, in part for some of the reasons that Amanda mentioned in terms of just the impact it has on, on real people on the ground and your ability just to hopefully try to improve the, the world that you live in. But, but I remember asking her, I said, well, Justice, that's, that's easy for you to say. You're, you know, this was, you know, she'd been on the court, on the Supreme Court then for over 15 years. Um, I said, but I'm, you know, I'm more focused on the Court of Appeals, and that's where I'm trying to figure out, is this where I'm going to be happier the rest of my life? And she said, even if I had never become a Supreme Court justice, if I'd stayed on the D.C. Circuit my entire uh, judicial career, I still would have been equally satisfied. Um, she said, I, it was the greatest job, you know, other than this one, it was the best job I could ever have imagined having, and I, I would have been perfectly content to stay on the, uh, the D.C. Circuit my, the rest of my life. And that really just uh, took away any hesitation I had about trying to, to jump in with both feet. And then she was so extraordinarily supportive. Um, you know, I was not a well-known lawyer, even in California, uh, let alone, I was certainly not well-known to, uh, to people in DC. And she, uh, she offered to speak to uh, the folks in the White House Counsel's Office who, you know, maybe they... Uh, wanted to find out whether I would be someone uh, that, that they should be interested in uh, in putting on the bench. And um, she was willing to talk to, to Senator Feinstein uh, as the process moved on. She, I, I really, I, I don't know for sure, but I have to imagine that the validation that came um, from her sort of uh, singing my praises to uh, to people that uh, were in a position to, uh, to make the decisions had to have a huge impact. And um, yeah, so she was incredibly supportive uh, throughout that whole long drawn out uh, confirmation process. And I remember the one um, <clears throat> piece of advice you gave me that really came in handy um, because the, the process just is not a fun one to go through. And I remember her just telling me, Paul, d don't worry about it. None of it is personal. It, it really isn't about you, no matter what people are saying and how painful it is and how upsetting it is. It really has nothing to do with you. It's, it's all, you know, it's a very political process. You just don't don't take it personally. Um, and, you know, once I finally was able to uh, to internalize that message, it, uh, it made it a lot easier to get through the rest of the process. One of the questions, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I think these, a lot of these battles are not about the quality or the credentials of the nominees. And it's inter interesting to remember that both she and Justice Scalia were confirmed by overwhelming margins, 97, 98 votes. Um, but, you know, the world has changed a great deal. And speaking of just sort of that change in the world, one of the questions we have, I think picking up on a remark of Nina's is, uh, Nina had spoken earlier about sort of the world being ready to change. Um, and so this question is regarding gender uh, equity in typically male dominated industries, such as the law, academia, sports, uh, do you think the world is, is ready to change? Um, so Nina, maybe I'll pose this question to you since you had quoted the justice about the world or the industry or the field or the sector being ready to change. You know, I got uh, vaccinated recently. There are certain advantages of being old. Um, <clears throat> so the world has changed. I mean, for somebody my age, I'm, I'm younger than Justice Ginsburg was by about a decade, a little over a decade. I couldn't get a job when I got out of college. I mean, people would just say to me, we don't hire women or we don't hire women for the night shift or the only women's positions we Phil are on the women's page, which was really awful. It was not the style section of today. It was recipes and rewriting fashion press releases. Um, so I take it that our questioner is not middle-aged because I still consider myself middle-aged. Um, I take it she is not middle-aged or she is not, or this is not the father of somebody who is middle-aged because the world today is so dramatically different than it was when Ruth Ginsburg started or when I started. And I can't pretend to be able to see what the future is, but I know that it will be in all likelihood better for women, for minorities, for gay people than it is today. And I think women more than any of those other groups have succeeded more robustly, I guess I would say, than those who are uh, African American or who are gay and lesbian and trans. And I say that with full knowledge that in some cases, 
I, I am of a generation that has my own biases and I have to beat them down with a stick. She wasn't, the amazing thing is that she wasn't like that. It did not bother her to meet, embrace, advocate for, and expect that Title VII would cover not just gays and lesbians, but trans individuals. And that's what was so remarkable to me. If you grew up in this world, by the time we got to the last 10 years, everybody knew lots of openly gay people, had friends who were openly gay, had children who were openly gay, and grandchildren. And, but they didn't have that same experience with trans people. And that is a real leap for a lot of folks, not for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's a great point. And uh, fun fact, Justice Ginsburg was actually the first justice of the Supreme Court to officiate at a, at a gay marriage. So LGBTQ rights were also a major concern of hers. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. Um, so uh, Amanda, I had promised them that uh, you would talk about the experience of working with Justice Ginsburg as an author since your book comes out, I think, next month. So can you talk a little bit about that in the last few minutes uh, that remain to us? Sure. And I'll try to be brief in case others want to chime in. Uh, I interviewed Justice Ginsburg at UC Berkeley in the fall of 2019. And after that, we decided since the interview covered the full arc of her life and career, we would turn it into a book project uh, that lays out some of, of her legacy as she saw it. So uh, we have uh, her final speeches, we have her handpicked favorite opinions, we have uh, different aspects from her time as an advocate, including the very first brief that she and Marty filed together in the Moritz case, which, which is at the heart of the movie on the basis of sex. Uh, that's never been published before. It's very exciting. You get an early uh, window into her thinking about strategy and how she was going to pursue her advocacy uh, career. Marty let her take it from there after that early and very significant victory with a male plaintiff, I, I should note. So it, it, it was really a special project for multiple reasons and a few vignettes. Uh, I should mention, I, I saw a chat pop up. The, the title of the book is Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue a Life's Work Fighting for a More Perfect Union. And I am very fortunate to hold an advanced copy that just came a couple of days ago. Um, and and uh, I'm just very excited. Beautiful blurb on the back from Nina Totenberg. Uh, so I'm very grateful to Nina for that. The, the project was, it was just so special to be able to work with her again closely on something 20 years after being her law clerk and in, in what turned out to be the final year of her life. The, the book releases alongside the book uh, about the first women law professors uh, in America, written by her very dear friend and co-author on the first casebook on gender discrimination in the law, Herma Hill Kay. And that book is called Paving the Way. It was very important to Justice Ginsburg to see that book published. And so our book was a little bit of a carrot to help make that happen. Uh, she wrote the introduction for that book. Then, you know, as we got into working on the book, how special it was, to, again, to get to work with her again and hearkening back to some of the things that have been said, including by Judge Watford, she was as rigorous a writer and editor as ever. Uh, the, the pages came back as marked up in ink as they did when I was a 25-year-old law clerk to her. And what is really amusing to me is I've been going back, as I said, through our correspondence. And over the summer, she was editing not just the drafts I sent her, but also, I'm embarrassed to admit, my letters to her. <laughs> So um, she was very much still teaching me how to be a better writer. And, you know, there was no rest for the weary. Um, so that, that was a really special part of it. And another, in keeping with the theme of, of the panel, I'll share this final vignette uh, that's really special. I wrote the introduction to the book. It describes the arc of her career uh, and, and obviously lays out what the book is about. I had at the end a discussion about being her law clerk and I had considerable discussion about how special it was to watch her and Marty uh, together. And when we talked about the draft, which she marked up significantly, she said, you know, there's just not enough about Marty in here. And so we went back and added more Marty. And I just, I, I, 
I'll get emotional if I say much more. The idea that over the summer, Marty was so present on her mind and this was, this was what she was thinking about. It's just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful vignette again into their grand love affair. Uh, so we are about to uh, conclude. I just wanted to give Ryan a last chance. I think I chatted that to everyone. And I meant to chat it just to Ryan. Uh, I wanted to uh, give Ryan one last chance to, to chime in on some of these themes. And then um, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the floor back over to, to Ronnie for some concluding remarks. So uh, Ryan, I'm really, this is kind of free form. Like I'm sure that the comments of the others have, have uh, provoked thoughts on your uh, part. Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, you know, I think that Justice Ginsburg had a fundamental optimism about the future. And uh, at the root of that uh, was that she always insisted on taking the long view, that she uh, insisted to us, you know, if we came depressed <laughs> or complaining, uh, that we situate the momentary struggles of the day against the backdrop of history. And you know, one quick story is uh, when we were clerking, uh, she organized a viewing of 45, uh, which is the Jackie Robinson biopic for all the clerks in the building and, and many attended. And it was in the small movie theater on the court's first floor uh, where the justices famously uh, applied Justice uh, Stewart's short-lived oh. <laughs> obscenity. Um, so it's a famous little movie theater. And, uh, you know, at the time she recounted, recounted watching Robinson play uh, baseball as a little girl in Brooklyn. And, and, and she recounted how unlikely it was that at the time that, she, that Robinson would today be viewed uh, as a hero uh, and be celebrated as a trailblazer uh, for his courage uh, and in addition to his play. And I think the message to us was that progress can seem halting and a struggle in the moment, uh, and you can feel very discouraged. Uh, I mean, I think if you were Jackie Robinson in the 1930s, uh, you wouldn't think that this was a ringing uh, celebration of progress. Uh, but if you press on, these moments of struggle can really lead to mo uh, meaningful change. And so, you know, I think that's the message that I'm trying to, to, to hold on to uh, as I reflect on her legacy, that from a single lifetime, this country went from Jackie Robinson to Frontiero uh, to today, and that the justice would really want us to be continuing her work. And uh, so we can look back at the end of our own lifetimes and, and view the progress that we've helped to contribute to. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists for your time and your insight. You've been amazing. Thank you to all the uh, attendees. Uh, at Lateral Link, we're just so proud to have been involved in such an excellent event. I'd now like to turn the floor back over to uh, Ronnie. Thank you, David, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, you can't hear the thousands of hands clapping for you all right now for sharing um, your stories and your insights with us. And, and David, thank you um, for doing such a wonderful job uh, getting all these stories together and for your help in putting together this event and for your um, forgiveness of me forgetting original jurisdiction's correct name. So thank you for all of that. I hope all of you watching today will uh, join the Center for Women in Law in continuing our work to support gender parity and please consider uh, becoming a member of our Ginsburg Circle. Uh, for more information about upcoming events and programs, follow us on social media and our website. Again, thank you to our panel today. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.